Welcome back. Hi everybody, James from Zygle Studios, and uh, hopefully you watched part one already, but thanks for coming back to Let's Build Bootloader part two. This is episode two of many parts, um, and today we're going to talk about a couple things. We're going to talk about our work list that we're going to generate. We're going to talk about uh, the materials we need to solve the problems we've broken down. So let's start from the top. So recapping from the last video, we went over the business case, you know, what the customer was talking about, what they observed. We went over uh, the requirements we broke down as to how to solve this problem and then we went into some of the high-level design and some of that might have been kind of confusing So let me explain why I did things this way. Uh, so the first thing is um, We talked about the business case because we have to know what the customer needs in order to drive the need for us to actually do this uh, the second thing is we drafted requirements because we need to know what we're solving so the customer gave us a very ambiguous situation and we had to kind of granularize that and make it a set of solvable problems. Um, engineers, that's what we do. We basically take a uh, gray area of ambiguity and we turn it into discrete solvable, solvable problems that we can uh, effectively break down and solve the ambiguous question to begin with. That's part of what you do as an engineer. It's not so much fine detail work all the time. You have to be able to deal with ambiguity and understand how to take direction from that to solve the problem. Uh, it's not just going to be, you know, what's 5 plus 5? Well, it's 10. It's not usually the case. It's going to be a little bit more diluted than that. So that's why I started with that first. Uh, and then we can kind of roll into uh, generating a work list based on the requirements. We know exactly what we need to do, so to speak. So now we need to figure out the details uh, of what that entails. And we need to figure out what, what kind is needed for that. The, another thing we need to do is, um, at that point, start executing. But before we do that, we need to understand what type of materials we need. We need to select a microcontroller, which in this case is already pre-selected, but beside the point, we'll still do the analysis for it. We need to figure out what type of external hardware we need, uh, you know, that kind of thing. We need to be able to have uh, enough equipment to be able to support our designs as well. So we'll be going over that. And then finally, like I said, we're going to talk about designing a state machine. And in this case, the state machine is very simple but uh, this will definitely help us and aid us in our next endeavor inside of this building of a bootloader. So without it, that being said, let's start generating that work list. So now that we know what our requirements are, let's start from the top. The first thing we're going to need with a bootloader is a memory map. Now what is a memory map, might you ask? Right here. This is a memory map. What? Why are you looking at me like that? You've never seen a memory map before? <laughs> I'm kidding. Let me show you what it really means. Memory maps are actually quite easy to understand and explain. So with a typical computing system that has non-volatile memory, there's a section of this non-volatile memory that's addressable, meaning that you can read, write, and erase from this flash memory. Now, there might be restrictions on how you can do those things, but you should be able to access those areas. With a single application, you don't really need to think about how the application fills up that area, you just need to know, well, that it's there and it works. Sometimes you need to worry about the size. If it gets too large, you might be knocking on the ceiling of the capacity of the flash memory, but usually that's not the case. However, when we start getting into more complicated applications, like when two applications need to exist within the same area of flash memory, or in this case a bootloader exists and an application exists, we need to make sure that the bootloader knows where to program the application, especially since we have over-the-air updating, but we also need to know where the application's CRC is, as well as the bootloader's CRC, so the bootloader can effectively detect to see if there's anything wrong with both itself or the application and sees operating. So a memory map is extremely important to organize your flash memory so that the programmer, i.e. you, understands where these things exist and can operate on them. Not so hard to pick up, right? We'll get into how to do this later. We're also going to need to design some finite state machines for the bootloader. And not just the typical application for the bootloader. We're going to need to design for the communication systems as well. The communication systems via UART is supposed to be a real-time system taking in messages uh, whenever they come in. So we need some kind of a finite state machine in order to determine whether or not the message is valid and whether or not we should respond to it. So not only do we need a finite state machine for the bootloader here, going over this basic functionality that we talked about in the first video, but we're also going to need a real-time messaging handling system on the UART side. And this means, of course, communications, finite state machine. Speaking of communications, not do only do we need to design a state machine for the communication system, we also need to design what's called a frame table. And this basically is secret knowledge between the tool and the micro 
of how to respond back and forth to each other, how to transmit and receive certain messages. If a message in a certain sequence has been received with the correct opcode, great, we can act on it and we can read the data coming in. This is how we program stuff back and forth. In another video, we'll get into how to design this frame table and the opcodes that are associated with it and how we can ensure data integrity is okay when we send a UART message as well. We're also gonna need a way to process that data. And typically the most difficult thing with serial data is how do we receive it, not necessarily how we send it. And with UART, this is no different. In this case, I've taken the approach of utilizing interrupts for the receive side of the UART and using a FIFO queue to push stuff into the queue and to get stuff from the queue. We also need to have stuff to write stuff to flash memory as well as erase, because if we're gonna be writing the application into the application space from our memory map, we need to have a way programmatically to access the correct areas of address. So between the frame table, the communications finite state machine, the RX FIFO queue, which will be circular in nature, and the non-volatile memory interfacing module, I think that pretty much rounds out most of the functionality that we'll need for our bootloader to do exactly what we want it to do. The next parts are going to be things that are more auxiliary but still necessary, but they won't affect the functionality of the bootloader itself. We also want to give feedback to the user of what's going on. We want to be able to make sure that if the bootloader is bad or the app is bad, there's a distinct light pattern on the board in order to be able to give a better indication of what's going on. Now we're starting to get into the weeds a little bit more. We have the functionality basically down, but the next things in the work list are a little bit more obscure. Luckily, I've done most of these things already, and they're open source, so I can just kind of pick and choose from the stuff I've done in the past. You're probably wondering at this point, we have a memory map, we have a application space, but how does the CRC that we use for error detection in the bootloader and the app actually get into Flash without having to write it the first time it's turned on? Programmatically, that'd be kind of a nightmare. Every time you look at the board, you'd have to check to see if it's in flash memory or not. And how do you check it the first time it runs? How do you know that that's not bad? These are all very good questions. And the one way to get around this is more obscure and kind of bizarre, but it's been done a million times and it's kind of annoying. You have to parse the Intel hex file that's generated from whatever your tool is. And at this point, you're able to take the data, use the same CRC method you're using on the microcontroller at runtime to calculate a CRC on your Intel hex file, take that file and have a flash tool flash it to your microcontroller. This is the most effective way of doing so. So what do you need? Well, you need a tool that can parse the Intel hex file, use your CRC method in that uh, with the data it parses, and then can actually append that into a new Intel hex file that you then flash on the device. Seems simple. But it's a lot more complicated than you might think. And like I said, luckily I have an open source tool that I wrote that does exactly this. The final thing is a little bit more complicated. This is creating a tool to actually interface with the flash programming of the device. So not only do we need another Intel hex parser, but we need a way to send that data through UART, through the computer, into the microcontroller, and have the microcontroller not only receive those things, but also send an acknowledgement back that everything's programmed okay. This gets a little more complicated. So we pretty much know what to do now. We've broken down everything into requirements. We know exactly what we need to do in terms of a work list. Well, we, so we have a bunch of stuff to do, but nothing to do it with. So what, what's now? It's time to start selecting some tools and our microcontroller to start moving forward with our design. The first thing we're gonna need to do is select a set of tools that we can work with. And this means a microcontroller, an IDE in order so we can actually program the microcontroller and do real-time debugging, as well as some periphery, because we need a way for a PC, or in this case an over-the-air, update tool to be able to communicate with our board. How can we do that? Seems kind of crazy, right? There's a lot of different things that you can do. Well, let's nail them down. This is the first step. Let's start talking about what we need. This is an STM32 F4 29 discovery board. It's a microcontroller or an eval kit that's got a few extra goodies on here to play around with. Now the reason I selected this one is because it's well, what I had laying around my house, but also it's a very very advanced microcontroller so we can see some interesting features in action and it does the job. This is something you would see in a professional grade device of embedded systems. Just because I had this microcontroller laying around my house doesn't mean I didn't give it any thought. So here we have the STM32F429 is what we're working with. And basically what we're trying to analyze is 
For our situation, for what we need peripheral wise, based on our design and our requirements, does this microcontroller fit the build for that? And really, we only need a couple things. Well, we need a microcontroller for one, and it doesn't need to run that quickly, but we need programmable flash memory. We also need a UART peripheral, and in maybe some cases we need a CRC peripheral unit, but since we're doing it in software, we don't really care. We don't need that. But one thing you notice is it has some acceleration, adaptive real-time acceleration for the flash memory, which is pretty cool. It's got 180 megahertz clock speed, which is pretty amazing as well. And it has NOR and NAND flash memories. So we're all in good shape for that. The next thing we need is a UART peripheral, and we need at least one, and we have four actually in this case, so that's fantastic. Uh, so that's exactly what we need. And like I said, there is a CRC calculation unit, but we don't need to use that peripheral, we're doing it in software. This microcontroller definitely fits the build for what we need. The great thing about ST Parts too is they have a wonderful configuration tool f called the STM32 Cube MX library. And essentially it allows you to configure all the peripherals in a visual form, so you can spend less time worrying about how to configure them from the datasheet. Which has its trade-offs, of course, but in this case it's totally fine. We know what we want and it's easy to run with, so that's what we're going to do. So how are we going to get our data from the PC, from the Intel hex file, to our microcontroller via UART? Here I hold a bag, an anti-static bag, for something called an FTDI cable. What it does is it has a little microcontroller of itself that hooks into the USB port on your computer. These interface with the drivers on the driver layer of your operating system and allow you to send UART messages back and forth through this little cable here. This is the USB adapter on one side, and on this side we have a breakout pin board that you can connect directly to your microcontrollers TX and RX UART, or in the case of half duplex, you tie the TX and RX together. This is how we're able to achieve the UART messaging from the PC tool down to the microcontroller. We have our microcontroller, we have an FTDI cable in order to communicate PC to a microcontroller through UART, but now we need a way to actually flash code onto the device and also real-time debug. What can we choose? There's a couple of different options you have. IAR Embedded Workbench is certainly an excellent choice for a situation like this. Or you can go with ARM system, Kyle, or Keel. I just say Kyle, so I'm going with that. I use Kyle and I think it's a great debugger. It's functional, has RTX RTOS support, and is clearly a very simple thing to use. You can also even go the route of STM32 Cube MX IDE, which is built basically off of Eclipse. But Kyle allows you to have some in-processor extensions for Cortex ARM cores that you might not get with something like that, at least out of the box. And while Kyle does cost a lot of money, there is an evaluation version. So if your code size per application is less than 32 kilobytes, you're able to program in real-time debug just fine. There are some features that you won't have, but that's okay. And that's what we're gonna sacrifice with. So Kyle IDE is what we're gonna stick with. So we have a microcontroller, an FTDI cable ready to go, IDE to start programming, and we have a work list that's generated and we have all the technical documentation we can need from ST's website of the STM32F429i. Well, now it's time to get to work. This is where the fun begins.